Good evening, my name is Jane McGee. I'm the high school principal at the American School of Bombay. Baby boomers, Generation X. Generation Y, or the net generation, the I generation. We are all touched by technology, but how does this change us or define us? For the past 25 years, Dr. Larry Rosen has examined generational differences, parenting, child and adolescent development, education psychology, and he is recognized internationally as an expert in the psychology of technology. Through his research and subsequent pu publishing, including his regular column in Huffington Post and in that of Psychology Today, he has gained international acclaim and not only is regularly invited to present at international conferences around the world and throughout the US, but has also been featured extensively on television, in print, and on the radio. His work is regularly quoted and resonates with psychologists, educators, and even more importantly, the general public. Dr. Rosen leads a very active research program and continues to consider the impact technology has on our lives, the way we think, write, interact, relate to one another, and conduct our work. In a world where change is now the only constant, he continues to examine the generational differences caused by shifts in technology, and more specifically, the impact this has on families and the role of parenting. His talk tonight will focus on keeping your family safe in an online environment, a challenge faced by all parents and teachers of the I generation. He will delve into both the psychology and neuroscience behind some of those frustrating behaviors of our children. Why do they seem unable to understand the consequences of their actions? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Larry Rosen. Thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is very personal to me because I have four children and two of them were born really before the technological revolution. Two of them were born after the technological revolution. And now I have a new grandchild who is born into who knows what is going to happen now. And as we know, young children as young as this baby here are already starting to use iPhones. This little girl is using the remote control to change the television at will. These are teenagers who obviously are using their smartphones to hang out and talk to everybody but the people they're with. <laughs> this is a couple who just got married and just changed their Facebook status as they got married. And then you have grandma and grandpa who are spending time learning how to use technology and also communicating with people through Skype. Let's face it, Steve Jobs was a genius. He created technology that appealed to everybody, from young children all the way up to older adults. And as I mentioned, I have a new nine-month-old grandchild, and what I want to show you is a short video of her first experience with an iPad. Her parents purposely did not introduce her to an iPad until she was about eight to nine months. And <laughs> they, they first started with a very simple game that is really a, an iPad app that's made for cats. There's a little fish swimming, and you'll see there's a fish swimming on the iPad. What I want you to do is watch her reactions and see how she reacts to it. Two things that I hope you noticed. One is she kept sitting back and then couldn't stand it and had to try to get that fish. And the second was the squeal of delight. This is what the children are feeling. What I'm really passionate about is how, as parents and educators, we can help young people learn to manage their virtual identities. What we know as adults is that pretty much every electronic communication that we do leaves a permanent trail. Emails leave a permanent trail, text messages do. Apps on your smartphone follow you around. They know where you are, they know what you're doing. Any visual games that you play, any online games that you play, all leave a footprint out there for people to find. 
And social media is the most important because it really presents your image to the world. Look at this list of social media and you will see that your kids and your students are on most of these social media platforms at all times. An FBI agent once said, think of anything that you post as a tattoo on your forehead. Who do you want to be looking at that tattoo tomorrow, six months from now, six years from now? It's permanent. Psychologists have been looking at the issue of identity. Irving Goffman thought that our identity was as an actor on a stage. So I'm here and what you're seeing is my acting. I am acting and you're seeing my person. He called that the front stage. As soon as I leave, I'm now part of the backstage. And I may have a very different personality on the front stage as I do on the backstage. I'm sure you've all heard of actors who on the front stage are marvelous actors, they're wonderful, and then you hear all these horror stories about how terrible they are in the background and how they yell at everybody and nothing makes them happy. Sherry Turkle, a psychoanalyst actually from MIT, talked about how we really have two selves. We have our, our self in real life, and then we have a second self in screen life. And you can see here visually that some people in their screen life opt not to show themselves, but to create an avatar to reflect what they think they want to be online. Carl Rogers, who is one of my heroes, talked about the fact that we ha really have three different selves. We have a real self, that's who we are. We have an ideal self, that's who we'd like to be. And then we have what's called the ought self. And this is the self that we think other people think we should be. And we actually have a lot of ought selves. I have an ought self of what my parents think I ought to be, what my kids think I ought to be, what my professional colleagues think I ought to be. It's all part of our ought self. Should we have an internet self, a self that reflects us through the internet? And so how do you present yourself to the virtual world? Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this comic strip, but this is from the New Yorker magazine. And you have two dogs depicted here. One is on the computer and talking to another dog saying, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. How will our children manage their virtual identities? That's really my concern and a lot of what I focus on in my work. 100% of your children, of all children, have left some sort of a virtual footprint by the age of 10. By the way, most of those virtual footprints are our fault. We post pictures of our kids online and we tag them with their names. We talk about them in emails. All of this is part of a virtual footprint that's left online. And really the problem is between their left and right ears. It's part of their prefrontal cortex. And you've heard a lot about the prefrontal cortex today, but let me try to describe to you how it grows. That's me, by the way, having my prefrontal cortex scanned. So the prefrontal cortex is the executive controller. It's the boss, it's in charge, it's where your memory starts doing its work, it's the focus part, it's the tension, it's what we attend to, it's involved in decision making, and for teenage purposes, the most important part is it's involved in impulse control, and it's involved in multitasking control. The nerve cells in the prefrontal cortex start out somewhat like an electric wire. You plug in an electric cord into the socket and you plug the other end into a device, and you expect the current to go from the socket to the device. However, they've covered the electrical wires there with a coating to allow the connection, the electricity connection to go from the wall to the device. Children are born without that covering. So literally they are born with nerve cells that have no coating whatsoever. As they grow, little fatty cells wrap themselves around the nerves, they're called myelin, and they try to keep the signal going from one point to the other. As for young children, those myelin start to wrap around the nerve cells, but they're not completely wrapped until you're in adulthood. One of the interesting things is the process takes time. The process of myelination takes time. And as you can see by this chart, you have the amount of myelin increases steadily until your 20s and 30s and gets up to a decent part and then peaks at 45, and then unfortunately for us who are over 45 starts to decrease, and our signals don't quite get to where that we want them to go, which is why, of course, we will walk 
from one room into another and can't remember why we left the first room and what we intended to do in the second room. My problem is I walk in the second room and go, um, I can't remember even why I'm here. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense to me. So what does it all mean? First of all, without myelin, the neurons don't work well. The last part of the brain to be myelinated is the prefrontal cortex, which is obviously the part that has to do with the executive and being controlled. And this doesn't happen really into our late 20s, sometimes early 30s. So what does it mean for our kids who are obviously not in their late 20s and early 30s yet? I don't know if you've seen the movie um, Strangers on a Train, but in this movie, an Alfred Hitchcock thriller, what you have is two people who have never met before and they meet on a train. And one has a horrible nagging wife that he would like to get rid of and the other, I can't remember, has a horrible boss or something that he'd like to get rid of and they decide to swap and murder each other's nemesis. And this is part of what happens online, that you get this false sense of safety behind the screen because you can't tell what's happening at the other end of the screen. Um, what you see, if you take out your phone right now, I know we're not supposed to use our phones, but if you take out your phone right now and you look, I see a reflection of me. That's all I see in my phone. I don't see who's at the other end. I simply see a reflection of me. And the problem is I have to decide how to present myself and particularly which self I want to present to the world. Do I want to present myself as a real self, as the ideal self, as my parents want to see me, as my colleagues want to see me, which self do I present? And if you're a teenager, that's much more complicated because what you want to do is present a self that's accepted. And so instead of maybe being honest, you try to look good and so you're presenting a self that's a little bit of a mixture of all the selves. You also don't know who's at the other end. When you hold up your phone, you only see yourself. You don't know the other person that you might be communicating with. And I talk a lot in my writing about this concept called context. The person at the other end is in a context. You don't have any idea what their context is. They could have just had a fight with their best friend. They could be very happy because they got an A on a test but you don't know what their context is, so when you send them a message electronically, all you know is that they got the message. You don't know how they received it, how they processed it, what they meant, what it meant to them, how they dealt with it. So there's this concept of safety behind the screen. The downsides are something we call disinhibition, meaning that you just sit there and type whatever you feel like without any um, expectation that the person at the other end is gonna take it one way or another. There is cyberbullying, which happens, we know it does. And again, it's the same thing of feeling the safety behind the screen and not knowing the person at the other end. And then at the ultimate, there's sexting, which is where you mistakenly send an interesting picture of yourself to somebody else and then it may be spread all over the world in five seconds. So which self do we want to present? And particularly, which self do we want our kids to present to the world? Well, one of, the, one of the aspects is trust. How do we know we can trust people? And in this comic strip, the little boy has gotten an F on a paper and he tells the teacher, what do you mean all my facts are wrong? I copied everything off straight off the internet. And that's the sense of trust, that they believe they trust the internet. There's also a false sense of privacy. I don't know if you've reset your privacy settings since Facebook redid them. Facebook seems to redo privacy settings about every 30 seconds. Um, I went through my privacy settings last week and I happened to be visiting a friend and his 10-year-old son helped me work through the privacy settings, thank you. Um, we also don't know who knows our business. We think when we send a message to someone that that person receives that message and they're the only one who receives it. But we know that messages can be forwarded. We can be tagged in pictures even though we don't want to be. Um, so we have no sense of where our messages go once we've sent them. So essentially the point is everything's permanent. Everything out there is permanent and we as parents have to deal with it. There's some very severe ramifications of this. 80% of colleges Google and Facebook applicants. 80%. 35% of applicants have been rejected because something that came up on either social media or Google. Getting a job, 91% of employers, Google or Facebook, 
their applicants, and 69% of applicants have been rejected because of something that was posted about them or that they posted. So these are very severe ramifications. So what I want to do is teach you now how to become a geek. And I'm not talking about a technological geek, I'm talking about a geek to help learn how to keep us all safe. So the G is follow the grandmother rule. Don't post anything that you wouldn't want your grandmother to read. And that's the same for children. Tell your kids, don't post anything that you don't want grandma to see or read. The E is for what I call an e-waiting period. And this is difficult, particularly for kids, because of the impulsivity that's happening in their prefrontal cortex. Anytime you write something, anytime you go to post something, anytime you write to post something on Facebook, a text, an instant message, I recommend to, to adults, to kids, that you walk away. You type it out and you walk away before, and you resist that urge to press post or send. So you walk away, you give yourself 30 seconds, you give yourself a minute, you come back, and then you ask yourself, hmm, is this gonna hurt someone's feelings? Is this really the way I want them to perceive me? Is this really how I want to be seen in this message? Most of the time you will find that you will revise the message and usually soften the message so that it doesn't hurt somebody at the other end. The second E is for starting early. Um, I think one of the most important lessons that I talk to parents about is that as soon as you give your child an iPhone to play with, which we all do because they're really fun, as soon as you let your child play with an iPad, that you have an obligation to start working with your kids and helping them understand what that means. And I highly recommend that you have weekly family meetings with your kids. And I talk to parents about how to do this. I say, everybody sits on the ground. And the reason you sit on the ground is because you want to equalize as best as you can the height difference between the big, tall parents and the little kids and because height differences mean power differences. And the family meetings when you have little kids are about a minute long. And you might say, gee, you just played with the iPad. What did you like about it? Was it fun? And as the kids get older, the questions change and the meetings get longer. So with a 12-year-old, you might say something like, hmm, I read in the news the other day about some kid who was cyberbullied. Do you know anybody who was cyberbullied? How did they feel? And then as the kids even get older, the questions start to change, and by the time they're teenagers, you should have a 15-minute family meeting once a week discussing something about technology. Now, the rule for parents is one minute of parent talking to five minutes of kids talking. So I always tell parents, ask a question, zip your lip, smile, and sit back and listen, because your job as a parent is to listen to the tone of what they say, listen to how they say things, Listen for those words that might signify a problem. Also, we know as psychologists that family dinners are critical. Four family dinners a week leads to a healthier family system. And then the K is you must keep vigilant. You must keep after this. You must manage where the technology is. You can't let your kids set up a little techno cocoon in their rooms. It's not healthy. You can't keep track of them. It's not easy to see what they're doing. At best, what you want to do is have the technology in some sort of a public place so that you as parent can walk by and you can see what they're doing. You want to monitor screen time. It's very important. When kids are little, one minute of screen time translates to five minutes of non-screen time. As they get older, that ratio switches. So by the time they're teenagers, it's five minutes of screen time to one minute of non-screen time because they're spending a lot of time doing their homework but also being in virtual worlds. You also want to practice co-viewing and these pictures show you all the different ways you can co-view technology with your kids. You can play games with them. You can be on the iPad with them. You can do all sorts of things with them and that way you can see what they're doing. And set Google alerts. If you don't know how to set Google alerts, you should always set a Google alert on your kids with their names. Go to alerts.google.com put in their name in quotes, and you will get alerts anytime their name is mentioned on the internet. So I want to thank you very much, and I hope you all become geeks.